When I was in the fourth grade, I was playing in my backyard one day when I looked up and I saw a kid lived on another block that I'd never seen before. He was just sitting there on his bike. His name was Ricky Gates. And from that moment on, we were partners. We were best friends and we did everything together. But there was one thing we did more than anything else, and that was compete. Anything and everything was a competition for us for years, decades even. So for instance, when we were little, there was one game we used to play that involved those little green plastic army men. And we had hundreds of them, and we would set them up like on the living room floor facing each other, uh, like they were getting ready to go to battle. And then we would each get a big pile of rubber bands. And my dad worked, had a, a mailing business, so we had access to lots and lots of rubber bands. And then for 60 seconds, we would each shoot rubber bands at the other guy's army. And when the clock ran out, we'd then count how many of our guys were still standing, right? And whoever had the most undisturbed army men won. That was the game. And then we'd do it again. I mean, we could make this last a whole day. Whether we were competing to see whose kite could go the highest in the spring, or whether we were playing horse uh, on my driveway, or playing ping pong in the basement of Capitol Hill Christian Church, we were always pushing each other. We were always competing. There's no proverb that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And I believe with all my heart that that's what we did for each other. Even though we sometimes would get mad or get our feelings hurt, it was good for us. I wish every kid could have that kind of friendship and have that kind of healthy competition in their lives. I say all of that because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm going to say next. My competition with, with Ricky was one of the best things that ever happened to me. But there's another kind of competitive spirit at work in me that isn't so healthy. I notice it, especially rising up in me, when I feel like I might be competing for scarce resources. So, good example. Simple illustration. If I'm really hungry and I notice that there might not be enough food to go around, I suddenly get very anxious about getting my share. Now, if I had grown up in a house where food was scarce, which was true for my friend Ricky, but it wasn't true for me, that might make sense, right? But I never wanted for anything as a kid. I had everything I needed and more. So when those anxious feelings arise in me now, it's not because of some past trauma or experience. It's because I'm afraid I might get the short end of the deal, right? That I might not get my fair share. I'm a nice guy, but don't get between me and that last piece of pizza <laughs> or that last piece of pie or whatever. I can be selfish. I know that about myself. I want things to go my way. If everyone could just please align themselves with my tastes, my beliefs and opinions, that would be perfectly fine with me. If I could also be the winner all the time, I think that would be fine too. If you could just make that happen. There is something in our human nature that drives us to look out for number one. I don't know if it goes back to... Uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, I think that's probably where I would start with all of that. Or if it has to do with Darwin's survival of the fittest, but basically the outcome is essentially the same. We want what's best for us and for ours, but especially for us. We don't want to lose. We don't want to be last in line. And we'll do just about anything we can to prevent that from happening. When Jesus explained to his disciples what it meant to follow him, he made it clear to them that they would be going up against a fundamental part of what it means to be human, essentially. He said, if you want to follow me, you have to die to self. 
You have to lose your life to find it. For the past six weeks, we've been talking about living dangerously. I'm not sure if Jesus ever said anything that feels more dangerous, then you have to lose your life to find it. It goes against our nature. It's counterintuitive. You've got to lose your It's a paradox. You have to lose your life to get it. But I believe that defeating that innate human tendency is the secret not only to faithful discipleship, it is also the secret to living a productive and fulfilling and happy life. Strangely enough, our, our nation's military leaders came to this same conclusion a long, long time ago. I was thinking this week that a uh, great example of this is boot camp, right? If you join the army and, uh, and you go to boot camp, the very first thing that you learn is that your wants, desires, opinions, and even feelings don't matter anymore. The army will tell you when to get up in the morning and when to go to bed at night. They tell you when, where, and what you will eat, what you want or what you think doesn't even enter into the picture. What matters is the United States of America and your promise to defend it. What matters is the mission. Now, of course, at boot camp, there's a drill sergeant there making sure you understand exactly what the assignment is. With Jesus, I think it works much the same way, but without all the yelling and the screaming. We don't have somebody standing there yelling at us. With Jesus, you're expected to make that choice for yourself. That's what Jesus said, meant when he said, if you want to follow me, you must first take up your cross. It's a decision we have to make. Nobody is going to make that decision for us. You might even say it's a call, an invitation to put away childish things and grow up, kind of like those Young recruits are forced to do when they go to boot camp. And believe me, they're happier for it on the other side. It's an invitation to grow up into the fullness of Christ, modeling His life and ministry up to and including His death on the cross. It's about accepting His mission as our own and allowing that needy, anxious, competitive voice inside of us to finally die away. Jesus wanted his disciples to follow him in the narrow path of selflessness. But as we see in the gospel, that wasn't easy. Especially for those disciples, those first disciples. And part of the reason it was so hard was because they didn't understand what it meant for him to be the Messiah. And for good reason. For, for centuries, Jews had been looking for a savior who would lead Israel back to political and military dominance. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for somebody like King David to come back and help them destroy their enemies or run the Romans off or whoever was lording it over them at the time. They were looking for a winner, not a loser. They were looking for a conquering king, not a suffering servant, not a sacrificial lamb. Jesus knew his disciples and everyone else was going to be confused about that, right? That's why so many stories in the Gospels, and if this has ever raised a question mark in your mind, it certainly has in mine, there's so many stories of people saying to Jesus, you are the Messiah, and then immediately he demands, he commands them, tell no one, don't tell anyone. Why would he do that? I think the reason he did that wasn't, wasn't reverse psychology because he really wanted them to go and tell other people. I think the reason he did that was because he did not want them to misunderstand the nature of his mission. They didn't, he didn't want them to misunderstand who he was as Messiah. For Jesus, being the Messiah was all about humbling himself, even to the point of death on the cross. So we're going to see this this misunderstanding kind of play out dramatically in our scripture reading for today. It actually plays out over the course of chapter 16 in Matthew. So in the lead up to our scripture reading, Jesus is talking to his disciples as they're entering into Jerusalem for the last time. 
And he asks them a question. He says, who do people say that I am? Who do other people say I am? And th that was apparently an easy question for them to answer. They say, some people think you're a prophet. Other people think you're John the Baptist, returned from the dead. And then Jesus kind of turns it around and he says, okay, that's what they think. Who do you say that I am? And for once, Simon Peter gets it right. He answers the question and he says, you are the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And the funny thing about this exchange is that Peter was right. He just didn't know why he was right. And so Jesus explains to him and to the other disciples what it means for him to be the Messiah. And it's not about winning. In fact, some people would think it was the opposite of that. Matthew writes, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Of course, Peter's response is about what you'd expect. We see that competitive spirit rising in him as soon as he hears that. He says, no way, no way, we're not going to let that happen. And then Jesus says, one of my I think this is one of the most dramatic turnarounds in the Gospels. Jesus says to Simon Peter, right two verses after he just called him the Messiah, Jesus says to Simon Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You've set your mind on human things, not on the things of God. And then Jesus gives what I think are the most dangerous marching orders of all time. We read in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26, then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Earlier this week, I, uh, I heard on the news that the, the Super Lotto jackpot is now back up to a half a billion dollars. This is usually when they start talking about it. And, uh, and when it starts getting up into those high numbers, it's, it, I can feel my own, even though I don't buy a ticket, I can feel my own competitive juices beginning to flow. And inevitably, when, uh, when it gets up there like that, I'll hear somebody say, you know, money can't buy happiness. And then inevitably somebody else will say, yeah, but I'd sure like to give it a try. When Jesus said, for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? I think he's addressing one of the biggest challenges to the Christian life. And that's the fact that we live in this world right now. We need money to survive in this world. We need food, clothing, and shelter it is hard not to become focused on those kinds of things. And yet we know Jesus is right. If our first priority is looking out for number one, if that's at the top of the list for us and winning at all costs, there's a very real possibility that we will get to the end of our lives and we'll look up and discover that we may have gained the whole world, but we've lost the most precious part of ourselves. There's only one sure way to make sure that doesn't happen, and that is to follow Jesus' command to die to self, to kill that part of ourselves that wants to be the center of the universe. One preacher I was reading this week called this process the Copernican revolution of the heart. I thought this was interesting. So, as you may know from history, for hundreds if not thousands of years, human people, humans believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that everything in the universe revolved around our little blue planet. But then a guy named Copernicus came along and said that the sun was the center of the universe and everything revolved around it instead. That was a tough one for a lot of people to swallow, especially religious leaders. It was a revolutionary idea, but I think it's exactly the kind of thing that has to happen in us. We're all born believing the world revolves around us. 
There's nothing more self-centered than a baby or an adult who acts like a baby. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we have to put aside childish things and grow up. We have to take Jesus' mission of love and service as our own. Real happiness is not found in self-centeredness, it's found in God-centeredness. In order to truly thrive in this world, we need to experience a Copernican revolution of the heart where God becomes the focus of our lives, not self. One of the first words that comes to mind when I think of that change, that transformation that has to happen in us, is humility. In Johann Arnold's book, Seeking Peace, she writes, Humility is not just gentleness or meekness. It demands vulnerability, the willingness to be hurt, it is readiness to go unnoticed, to be last, to receive the least. Humility offers nothing in the way of peace as the world gives, and plenty that destroys it. Yet it describes the way of Christ better than any other word. It is the way of Christ, and as such it brings the deepest and most lasting peace. A great saint of the church was once asked where he found Jesus, he smiled and said, right where I lost myself. That's the key. In the same way we can't receive a gift in a closed fist, we can't receive the abundant life that God wants to pour into us until we let go of ourselves. The more we cling to our lives, the more we lose what's real and what's eternal. As we see in the Gospels, the first disciples were a little bit put off by some of this stuff, at least at first. So if taking up your cross and losing your life sounds a little scary, that's okay. It took a minute for Peter and for the other disciples too. But the good news is that Jesus shows us the way. We don't have to guess what that looks like. He lived it to the very end and he calls us to do the same. It's my prayer that we will have the courage and the wisdom to follow.